Welcome to the Peter King Podcast, the first Peter King Podcast of 2022. So much to talk about in the National Football League. We'll be joined later in the podcast by Aditi Kinkwabala of the NFL Network. Uh, she covers the Steelers and the Browns and mostly the uh, AFC North and a lot of events in the AFC North to talk about, some of which we're going to be hitting on today, Ben Roethlisberger and, uh, and Baker Mayfield and their futures, what's happening uh, with both of those franchises. So we'll get into that with Aditi a bit later on. Uh, but first, uh, welcome to the new year, Paul Burmeister, my friend from NBC Sports. Thanks for joining me. And how are things? Everything is good. Uh, as you sit here and say, first first show of 2022. Every time I hear 2022, I just have to shake my head here a little bit. Uh, but excited to be rolling into the new year and doing so talking a little football with you. Well, you know, Paul, I think one of the most interesting things is that, you know, sometimes there are things that you just don't see coming. And I don't refer to Antonio Brown. We'll touch on him a little bit later on. But you know, if you had asked me at the start of this year to talk about sort of the teams that I loved this year, one of the teams was the Cleveland Browns. And now I think now that the Browns are out of the playoff race, will not make the playoffs. Um, to me, everything is in question about the Cleveland Browns. And I hate to start the podcast on a downer, but... I think one of the big questions that a team has to answer this year, and it might not be a big question at all. Everybody has said, gee, are the Browns going to sign Baker Mayfield long-term? Just so that everybody understands, Baker Mayfield is under contract for 2022 at $18.8 million, which is the fifth year of his original rookie contract. Teams can uh, opt to exercise the fifth year clause in a rookie's contract if he's a first round pick. And that's what the Browns have done with Baker Mayfield. So he will be on this team, theoretically, unless he's traded uh, in 2022, basically on a one year basis. And Paul, I honestly think that's probably the only way that the Browns can go. This is a guy as the playoffs loomed, his last six games of this season, he's completed 53% of his passes with nine touchdowns and 10 interceptions. And he just simply, uh, I, I know he's hurt. He's got the, the labrum injury that's going to require surgery. I know he's hurt. I get it. And I hate to be, uh, you know, not very pragmatic about this. But I believe that if a player is on the field and if he is, if he's playing football and he does not perform well, I don't want to hear, oh, but he was hurt. He was hurt. It, it, you know, it doesn't, you, you can't really count this. Baker Mayfield has been on the field and yes, he hasn't been totally healthy, but I think what I have seen would make me say, Baker, sorry, you got to sing for your supper in 2022. Uh, yeah, a number of thoughts come to mind with Baker here, Peter. Number one, first of all, I think my my first two reactions are, are the same reactions a number of fans probably have. You may have as well. Uh, number one, $18 million for a starting quarterback isn't that much in today's day and age. So that's the first thing because it's going to influence what they do with him. And number two, you see so much good with him. We haven't seen it for a while, but it's been there. And you also see so much bad that the ranges of, of how he can play. And you bring up a very good point. He's been playing hurt, but it's the NFL way. It's the number one way to earn respect or to lose it. Do you play when you're hurt? And how well do you play when you're hurt? So that's just part of the deal as well. Uh, but two, two examples here, Peter, to kind of illuminate my, my, my first reactions about the money, which, which isn't very much, and about his range. Let's look at two games this year. The first game against Kansas City, he was terrific right away. I mean, it was fun watching that game in Arrowhead. They were up and down the field. Uh, he was efficient, accurate. But then at the end, he wasn't as good as Mahomes. He wasn't quite good enough to win. A couple weeks ago at Green Bay, tight game, one-score game. 
Browns rush for over 200 yards. You normally win that kind of game unless your quarterback turns it over. In the end, one quarterback throws a handful of picks. The other quarterback doesn't throw any. Those are just two games. But this is kind of who he is at this point. There are a lot of triple and double bogeys that he puts up on his scorecard when he could have had par. And I don't want the Browns just to be influenced by, well, $18 million isn't that much. He's got potential. Let's invest in this again. Uh, I think he kind of is who he is at this point. And yeah. if there's an option to get better, I think they ought to do it. Yeah, I, I've i covered the Rams and Ravens on Sunday in Baltimore, Paul. And, you know, I think sometimes you can – win because of your quarterback and I think sometimes you can win in spite of your quarterback and in the last two games the the Rams have faced wounded teams on the road uh, they faced Minnesota and Baltimore and they beat them both Baltimore pretty fortunately but they won with Matthew Stafford turning it over in both games three times you can't live with that long term. That will ruin the Rams in the playoffs. They'll, if they, you know, I think they'll probably win the division, the NFC West. And if they do win the division, I think that'll ruin them in the first game. But I also look at the promise that he has shown. And that's one of the reasons why, in my opinion, the knee jerk reaction, if you're a Browns fan, is enough of Mayfield get him out. And I always ask this question. Okay, who are you going to get? Are you going to pick a quarterback with the whatever it is, the 17th pick in the draft? And look, we don't know about these guys yet, Paul. You, you I'm sure you have a much uh, a stronger opinion of the guys who are going to come out in the draft than I do. But I don't, I just don't think that you can say right now with any certainty, okay, I'm taking player X. I'm taking the North Carolina quarterback. I'm taking the Mississippi quarterback. It, it, I think it's unrealistic to say, let's throw away this guy and draft somebody else, particularly since you're on the hook for almost $19 million for him next year. Play it out, see what you got. Who knows? By this time next year, you may be saying, uh, He's worth it to sign long term. But as of right now, I hold off on that and uh, I bring him back for this last year. And you know what? If I'm Baker Mayfield, I don't want to sign a contract right now. I, why would I want to sign a contract when my value is at a nadir? That's N A D I R, not a deer. <laughs> but what I just, I don't think it'd be smart for him. Uh, he impresses me as a bright guy who understands the way of the business world. And uh, so if I'm him, I'm not taking, uh, I'm not going to say, hey, sure, I'll sign long term for 25 million a year or something that is way below uh, the market of a lot of the good quarterbacks. But, and I think that's probably the way the Browns will go. A crushingly disappointing season in Cleveland a lot of it because of the inconsistency and poor play at quarterback uh, that has to be fixed. But you know what? I just say one other thing, Paul, I think Kevin Stefanski has got to go to school on his play calling. Uh, I think he's had some moments this year that have been really, really poor and, you know, particularly late in the season. And so, and I like Kevin Stefanski. I think he's a good coach. But I also think that what he called late in the game uh, at Green Bay in not uh, handing the ball to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to me, uh, one of the best running games in the NFL, uh, I just think it was a big mistake. But look, I think if you're a Browns fan, there's a lot to look forward to. You just got to get the bad taste of the end of this season on your mouth. Are you still a Browns quasi believer how do you feel about him yeah and uh kind of like you peter I, i've got a little skin in this game too with the browns i i picked them to go to the super bowl so i, I would like to see them do well i, I want to believe that they're going to be that good and 
we've, we've talked about Baker. I think there's reasons to believe and not believe. You bring up Kevin Stefanski, and one of the reasons that you hire any organization hires a, a coach without a lot of head coaching experience or no head coaching experience, you think he's bright, and you think because he's young, he can grow. Well, now here's a real test of those two things for Kevin Stefanski. Without a doubt, he's bright. Without a doubt, he has potential. But how's he going to grow from this kind of a low point, uh, whatever role he played in this season being so disappointing? You hired him because you thought he was smart and he'd get better. Uh, now that light's going to be shining on him to show that here next year. Let's talk about the team that the Browns lost to on Monday night, and deservedly so. Uh, I think Najee Harris, in his best game as a pro, uh, was the best player on the field. Ben Roethlisberger is kind of limping to the finish line. Uh, not got a lot of help from his receivers on Monday night, but also missed some throws down the field as well. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger, in my opinion, is making the right call uh, by walking away from the game after this year. It's time. He looks old. He looks logy. He looks a little bit lethargic. But I thought, Paul, more than that, there will be time to you know, to uh, break down Roethlisberger, the player. My feeling is when I look at him and look at the Steelers, it's the right time. And I thought that was a tremendous show on Monday night of a, of a city saying goodbye to its quarterback. Uh, after the game where, you know, he basically went around the stadium and and, uh, you know, mingled with all the fans. I thought that was really, really nice. And his family coming down was great, too. Um, it, it just, that's the way it should have ended. Beating the arch rival Browns at home uh, and getting to take a victory lap around your stadium. How did you see it? It's all the same way. Um, really made me smile. And we all have some level of personal connection to these quarterbacks that have been around for so long, Peter, because you and I have been around all these stadiums to all these press conferences. And I'm sure we each have stories about covering him. I, I remember in 2003, I was in local TV, Peter, uh, in Eastern Iowa. And I used to, to shoot with the camera all of the Iowa football games. And then I would put together a little package and I would anchor the six and 10 o'clock sports. But on one early fall afternoon, 2003, Miami of Ohio came to Iowa City, wow. and they had this 6'5", 190 quarterback who just kept escaping the pressure to the right and throwing the ball downfield. I, I think he threw three or four picks, but you could see then what kind of talent he had. And the next year was my first year at NFL Network, his first year in the NFL. And I just remember so well, there was such energy and such fun to when he got inserted into that lineup. And remember, Peter, they won nine or 10 or 11 games in a row. And they had good players around him. But he was just playing in such a different way, just swatting people away in the pocket, escaping to the right, making plays. Uh, it was exciting. It was different. There were a lot of quarterbacks playing well, and there still are now. He did it his own way. So watching him basically say goodbye last night, uh, I thought about how he came into the league and all those good memories. And uh, I'm with you. That, that ended the way it should have. What do you do if you're the Steelers now at quarterback? Do you draft the best one available in the first round this year with the 19th pick in the draft? Or do you go very, very hard after Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson or, or, or whoever you might like? Who knows? Derek Carr. Uh, what, what do you do if you're the Steelers? Yeah, I mean, knowing, knowing their general manager, Kevin Colbert, a little bit, Peter, he doesn't strike me as the kind of person who's going to be in the game of trying to spend all that money and all those picks to get Wilson or to get Rodgers. I, I think that's off the table with the Steeler way. I also don't think they have the quarterback of the future on their roster. So to me, it comes down to two things. You bring up one of those names. Derek Carr is a really good quarterback. He might be available. That's a pretty good next five or six years if you picture Derek Carr on that Steelers team, if they upgrade that offensive line. I would also include Jimmy Garoppolo in there. I would covet Carr a little more, but I think Garoppolo is a good quarterback for obvious reasons with what they've done in the draft. He might be available as well. I would kick the tire on those two options first, but then with where they're picking in the draft, Peter, the quarterback personality in this draft, and we're going to get to know it better over the next few months, the first or second favorite guy there for Kevin Colbert might be available in the teams, whereas in the past few years, 
there were going to be four quarterbacks gone at that point. There might only be one or two. Who knows? The best quarterback might be available when they pick. So I think they have two really good options with, with the car, Garoppolo, or the draft. I just don't see them going into the game to get Rodgers, Wilson, or maybe even Deshaun Watson. Yeah, I think you're probably right on that. But, you know, I also think of this. I think that if David Dunn, who's Rogers' agent, if they decide, if Rogers decides he wants to be traded this offseason, and 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 I would at the very least, if I were David Dunn, I would call the Steelers just to see if there might be some level of interest, or I'd have a conversation because remember, Paul, you know. It, it wasn't long ago that we were all scratching our heads and saying, man, the Steelers traded a one for Minka Fitzpatrick. True. Yeah. I mean, is that that we all said at the time, boy, that's not really the Steeler way. Well, I think it is the Steeler way. The Steeler way <laughs> is let's see the landscape and see how we can get better. And look, I'm not saying that they would, you know, mortgage the farm uh, to try to get Wilson or Rogers, but I, I would at least consider it. If you have a chance yeah. to get Aaron Rodgers, and, and you know you you don't have to really pillage your team to do it. You just have mm -hmm. to give up draft choices and maybe one player. I, I would I'd think about that. But I think it's a yeah I think it's a great point, Peter. And just to to put a tag on that one, even though I don't know if Kevin Colbert will do it. I think it would be awesome for the league if Russell Wilson or Aaron Rodgers in a Steelers uniform. I mean, that, that's yeah. NFL royalty. Those are still two. It's the best quarterback in the league and one who's still in the top five. Uh, again, just as a fan, I think that would be really fun to picture 2022 with one of those two guys in the Steelers uniform. It'd be great for the league. Paul, I want to ask you about Roethlisberger's legacy. And and I want to just discuss Roethlisberger's legacy for a little while. He'll, he will forever be connected with Eli Manning and Phillip Rivers. Uh, because obviously, Eli Manning, the first pick in 2004, Phillip Rivers, the fourth pick in 2004, and Ben Roethlisberger, the 11th pick in 2004. And I think what I will always remember about this draft really is what might have been. That was the draft I'll never forget. On that weekend, I was in Oakland. I had to sit down with Al Davis the day before the draft and you know, talking about what they were doing. And the Raiders that year had all three quarterbacks into Oakland. And Al Davis had conversations with Eli Manning with Roethlisberger with Philip Rivers. He sized them all up. And then what does Al Davis do? He takes Robert Gallery of your beloved Iowa oh, Hawkeyes. Right. And he passes because remember, uh, it, it, Eli Manning was the first pick in the draft by San Diego. There was the uncomfortable scene of him standing on stage because he and his dad had basically made it clear they didn't want to go to San Diego and they wanted to go somewhere else. So while the trade was being worked out between uh, San Diego and the Giants at number four, you, you know, Al <laughs> steps to the plate and he picks a guy who by year three ended up being a guard and a decent guard in the NFL. But that was one of those picks that now you look back on it and you totally, absolutely scratch your head at, and you say, what might have been? And then the other, what might have been is, you know, the Cleveland Browns passing on, uh, on Roethlisberger in this particular draft um, and how football history could have been changed by either one of those. But now as you, as you watch it, Paul, and, all three quarterbacks now will have left the game after 17 years and after 18 seasons, but after 17 years, how do you see all of them in NFL history 
And if you had to rank them one, two, three, what direction do you think you'd go? Well, that was the wrong year to be J.P. Lawsman as a first-round pick in the draft, wasn't it, Peter? <laughs> the, the other guy that got picked. Um, I, I would rank Roethlisberger one, Manning two, and Rivers three. And I think they're all Hall of Famers, Peter, but I think Ben Roethlisberger is the only slam-dunk first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, Eli, I think, will eventually get in because of the two Super Bowl wins, the role he played. Rivers was way too good for way too long in the regular season to not get in at some point. But Ben's a first ballot Hall of Famer all day long. And the two Super Bowl wins he was a part of, you know, make him a slam dunk to get in. But two parts of his game that, that I'm always going to remember, uh, we, we've kind of brought up the draft a little bit here, Peter. And about quarterbacks, we will often say in April, well, he needs a clean pocket. If that pocket gets muddy at all, you know, he's, he's, he's just not that good. Think about how good Roethlisberger was when everybody got yeah. around him in the pocket. I mean, that was just different. That was special. That was Hall of Fame worthy, what he did with people crashing around him. Uh, I haven't seen anybody play like that. A lot of guys can evade pressure to run. He evaded pressure in the pocket to pass, and it was just awesome. He did it better than anybody else. And the second thing I think it gets overlooked for his legacy, Peter, he threw the high arcing ball down the sideline as well as anybody the last 20 years. And I'm not just talking about the 60-yard post down the middle, that 45 to 50-yard touch pass down the sideline, or that 30 to 40-yard kind of kind of fade route that sometimes is, is lofted and sometimes is driven in there. He was so damn good at that. I don't think he got enough credit for that because right. of how well he did some other things. Uh, but he had those two qualities uh, that to me, not just the two Super Bowl wins, but those two qualities make him a first ballot Hall of Famer all day long. Yeah, I, I would put him in the exact same order, Paul. Um, and this comes from a guy who there were times over the last 17 years where I would have put Philip Rivers number one. That is the high regard I had for him, uh, especially around mid-career. But the thing about Roethlisberger that I think is so important to realize and, and has been so important for the life of his career is that he always was an absolute tree trunk and so hard to bring down and yeah. so hard to knock out of games. And, it, you know, Eli went through some really shaky moments in his career, both at the beginning and at the end in part because of the Giants, obviously, it, it, you know, and a lot of their weaknesses in personnel uh, at various points of his career. Um, Rivers had some shaky times as well, not as many as, as Eli Manning, but Roethlisberger, it always seemed to me, every year I'd go to Steelers training camp in Latrobe and I would say, if everything goes right, these guys got a good chance to be in the Super Bowl. And, and I, I just couldn't say that about those other two guys. I do want to say one thing about Eli Manning, that in my opinion, you simply cannot dismiss. And, and I get it. I absolutely get it. That Eli Manning career uh, it, it has, had, has had some moments that were not shiny and bright. But I really think, even though... I mean, this is the craziest thing to think about, Paul. Eli Manning in his entire career had only two postseasons, only two that he won games. Hmm. But in each one of those postseasons, he takes the Giants from the wild card round to win the Super Bowl. And he does it. He does it. And this is just amazing to me. Eight postseason games in 2007 and 2011 all but one of those games away from home obviously the Super Bowl is a neutral site game but in those six playoff games before the Super Bowls he won he was five and0 oh on the road mm. and and not only <clears throat> five and0 oh on the road but how about in January 2008, beating Brett Favre in overtime yeah. in Green Bay? How about January 2012, beating Aaron Rodgers and, and decisively at Green Bay 
in the playoffs. And then each time, first beating the uh, 18-0 and New England Patriots uh, in that first Super Bowl, and then beating the Patriots again uh, in, in the 2011 season. Anybody who would have any doubts about Eli Manning in the Hall of Fame, first of all, he's going to finish. By the end of this year, he'll be top 10 in all the categories. I think Matt Ryan is about to pass him in, in touchdown catches, which will put him right, or touchdown passes, which will put him right at 10. But I, I always have that answer for people who say, well, I don't know about Eli Manning. And I think you, you are right. You are right. I think that the easiest Hall of Famer of the three is Ben Roethlisberger, but every one of the three will have my vote. I can't think of a quarterback who kind of needs that postseason. In a way, it's a compliment to him, but his postseason resume more than Eli Manning to get into the Hall of Fame. I think there was also, as I was listening to you there, Peter, I think there was a game at San Francisco, a postseason win, a lot oh. of points where he, he made some big throws. And that's the thing. It wasn't just a Super Bowl in those divisional or championship games you can go back to, to multiple big time intermediate to down the field throws that he made in really big moments in the postseason so uh, it, it's a nod to how much a postseason means uh, to a quarterback's resume that he's going to get in yeah I think what you're talking about is he beat uh, the 49ers 20 to 17 in the NFC championship game and I'll never yeah, forget right I'll never forget after the game Pat Hanlon, the Patriot, the Patriots, the Giants PR guy takes me into Tom Coughlin's office. And I spent maybe 10 minutes with him after that game. I'm writing it for Sports Illustrated. And Tom Coughlin was, I, you know, he's obviously a lot of times you see him, he's kind of a dour guy. Tom Coughlin was over the moon. <laughs> of all the things I, I'll remember that about that game, but that was just one of the coolest one of the coolest moments to see Tom Coughlin uh, so incredibly excited. Okay, so let's get to a few other topics, NFL topics, as we head into week 18 and everything that is going on around the NFL. You got Joe Judge's rant. You've got a tight race in some of the awards now. Uh, we're going to discuss Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, you've got Antonio Brown. You've got what teams do we really love right now? And man, I, I think I, I could pick out 10 teams easily right now, this moment that I think could win the Super Bowl. That's what's so fun about starting the new year with so much mystique. But I want to just start uh, our little quick hit section here. What occurred to you when you listened? to that 11 minute rant by Joe Judge? Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not in favor of getting rid of a coach who's only had a couple of years, especially when his young first round quarterback has been injured. Uh, that's kind of in the abstract. Uh, but second, that the one I have the most emotion about, the most feeling about Peter, is the feeling that I've watched the Giants since their bye week and they've lost six out of seven games. And like, when, when you start to evaluate a coach and think, boy, is he gonna be around? Is the organization going to get behind this guy and they're not winning? You start to think about, okay, are, are they improving at the end of the season? Yeah. No. Are they playing in an inspired way at the end of the season? No. I mean, th that's, that's nap brand football the Giants have been playing, Peter. That's, if you're somebody who likes to have a golf tournament on to take a nap on the couch because it sounds nice, the Giants have played that kind of football here in November and December. It has not been an exciting watch. It makes you pay attention. That like, is such a, that's such a great image. It really it's is. It's true, isn't it? It's yeah. so boring that it'll put you oh to sleep gosh. on the couch watching it. <laughs> yeah. At one o'clock, as a fan of no team, just a fan of, of football that's exciting, I turn on the TV at home, Peter, and living here in Connecticut, and it's the Giants, and I'm like, oh, I got to sit through this again. And that's harsh to Giants fans, uh, but just as a fan of football, that's what it's looked like. So when I, when I listen to his rant, I think about, okay, what have I seen from this team the last couple months? Uh, I've seen uninspired, boring football. So uh, I hope they bring him back because I think coaches should get more than two years. But I would certainly understand if the Giants felt like they shouldn't. I'll say this, Paul. I have been totally on board with John Mayer. I remember 
you know, the uh, president slash owner of the Giants. Uh, I've been totally on board with him basically saying, I am not going to make a quick decision on this coach. I've thought all along, absolutely unequivocally, unless he robs a bank in East Rutherford in broad <laughs> daylight, that Joe Judge was going to have at least three years. Sunday made me really shook my confidence in that statement and made me think, all right, now the Giants have to seriously consider making a change. I'm not saying they have to make a change. I'm saying they have to seriously consider. And yeah. Paul, you know how you see a play and you look at it and you basically say that play is deeply disturbing. Here was yeah. the play for me on Sunday against the Chicago Bears. Right before halftime, the Bears kick a field goal. With about a minute to go, they kick off to the Giants. Farrell Cooper, the return man, waves everybody off, says, let the ball go. Well, the ball bounces at the four-yard line, and it doesn't go into the end zone. It just goes sideways. And Farrell Cooper, it's like he's blasted out of uh, – he's got a stick of dynamite up his rear end, and he sprints to save uh, the ball and, 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 and dive on the ball, get the ball before the Bears can come down and recover it. Joe Judge is a special teams coach. That's He was hired as a special teams coach out of New England. That's That resume helped get him this job. And to have the most, the biggest special teams gaffe of this year in the NFL happen in the midst of a debacle of a game for your team, that really bothers me a lot. And, and, and how about this? The Giants follow it up. They can't get the ball out of their own end. They get a safety. They kick it back to the Bears, okay? And the Bears come down and get another field goal before halftime. So just uh, that really bugged me. And then the 11-minute diatribe at the, end of, at the end of the game. To me, it was Joe Judge wanting to sound like a tough guy. And I don't doubt that he is a tough guy. But it's Joe Judge sounding like a tough guy. And what I thought immediately when I heard this on Sunday night, I said, he's not talking to the reporters. He's not talking to the fans. He's talking to John Mara. He's talking to Steve Tisch. He's saying, we got this thing, guys. Don't worry about it. We're headed in the right direction. And Paul, I am so sick of hearing coaches talk about how, hey, we're building a really good culture here. We are got, we got this culture totally turned around. You just lost to whatever the Bears were, a four-win team by 26 points. And you had minus 11 net yards passing. And you're standing up there talking about the great culture you've built. No one gives two craps about culture. Stop with the culture. Can you win football games? That's all anybody cares about. Culture's right. a nice, cute term, okay? But it means nothing. Your team stinks, and you got to take responsibility for that. Anyway, end of Joe Judge rant. And I don't know what the Giants should do, but I do think that they've got to consider all options. All right, Paul, give me your thought about defensive player of the year. It could be the T.J. Watt's seminal performance on Monday Night Football with four sacks, getting him to 21 and a half for the year, will finally get him the defensive player of the year. It seems like he's been knocking at the door for that. But he's got some good competition. Stephon Diggs with the most interceptions uh, of any player in the NFL since 1980. He's had 11 of them. Uh, you know, Robert Quinn with the Bears set the single season record for sacks with that storied franchise. And Aaron Donald, who's always tremendous, Micah Parsons. How do you handicap it? Who do you like? I think I think if you got into the minds of, of offensive coordinators and specifically offensive line coach and said, who do you least want to face this weekend? I think that's still Aaron Donald. I think he's the one who creates the most headaches. And man, he's had some pockets of play this year where he has just been so dominant. I don't think he'll win. I think it'll be T.J. Watt. I don't know how you can have over 20 sacks. Uh, let's face it, in that uniform, as a Steelers defender, it just looks a little different there. And he's missed a couple of games, too. So yeah. uh, to be at that number, 
He hasn't been out there every game, and he plays in Pittsburgh. I mean, that's the guy. I point out the Pittsburgh thing because I think it matters a little bit, but mostly I think he deserves it. You know, having over 20 sacks uh, is an amazing feat when you've missed a couple games. I think he's the guy. I I would do T.J. Watt one, Aaron Donald two, uh, and I probably would have Diggs third. And I know he's given up a lot of yards in man coverage. I get it. But he's also made so many big plays. And he's also added, what, 147 yards on his returns. Uh, I would probably have him third uh, on the list, even though he is the bane of analytic, uh, uh, (laughs) of of pro football focus's existence uh, because of all the yards he's given up. Um, Paul, what's your takeaway now? with Antonio Brown. Um, and, and now that you've had a couple of days to digest it, give me your take on Antonio Brown and the Bucks and enabling and all that. How do you look at what happened with Brown on Sunday night? Uh, an, an amazing spectacle, obviously, in an unfortunate way. And even though nobody could have predicted the, the specifics of how that would end, that that would kind of be the, uh, the the way it came to a close. I don't think anybody should be surprised that it ended poorly. I mean, there were so many signs leading up to it. I'll, I'll pick out one of the more minor incidents, but think about how he reacted a couple of years ago, Peter, to, to his helmet. And he wanted a different helmet. Yeah. And at that point, I remember thinking, man, there are probably a hundred guys in the league that wish to wish it was a little different, but nobody else is behaving this way. Nobody else is coming close to behaving this way about the helmet. And that's just one example that this is a guy who is capable about behaving in a way in a situation that was just so much different and so far off. I don't think we should be surprised that we saw that. Again, you couldn't have predicted the specifics of it, uh, but if there was going to be one person in the league who, who behaved this way, like if you said, hey, Peter, somebody this weekend in one of the games is going to take his uniform off and run off the field. He probably would have had Antonio Brown on the list of people. Might have been a list of one. So unfortunate ending, unpredictable ending. But there was, there's no way you can say uh, you didn't know this was going to end poorly, whether it was next week or next year. Paul, give me. I, I'll just give you my very uh, quick sort of Cliff's Notes version of this. Mike Florio and I of Pro Football Talk were having this discussion earlier today as we record this on Tuesday, and he said he would not be shocked if some team picks him up for the playoff push. And I just said that team would be out of its mind. Mm -hmm. Um, the, The bigger issue to me right now with Antonio Brown, somebody who knows him has got to get him help. You know, he's... He responds irrationally. When I was talking to Bruce Arians on Sunday night after the team returned to Tampa, he called me late Sunday night. The one thing that stood out from our conversation is he said he had that look in his eye that I haven't seen in a while or some form of that statement. And, you know, like the look in his eye that he was about to go off into outer space again, which he has done in his career, challenging Mike Mayock in Oakland and all the crazy things he did in Pittsburgh. Michael David Smith of Pro Football Talk had a great tweet the other day saying it's absolutely amazing that Mike Tomlin was able to get what he got out of Antonio Brown for nine years. Mm -hmm. I I mean, uh, I'd love to hear the the I'd love to hear Mike Tomlin's story from very behind the scenes on Antonio Brown. But look, so I, I would be very, very I'll be surprised if he plays again, period. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing that has to happen now is people who love and care for Antonio Brown, whoever they are, they've got to get him professional help. He too often just reacts the way uh a five-year-old would react to situations. And it just, you just, as an adult, you just can't do that. You, you just, it's it's just, it's just not right. And, and again, I'm not making light of it. I'm not making fun of it. Sure. I'm not doing, 
I I'm just simply saying he needs help in dealing with the emotions, the demons, whatever. Not to mention the fact that who knows, he may have the beginnings of CTE. Um, we just don't know. And you can't know uh, before you're able to actually look at a player's brain. But this is a two hour discussion of Antonio Brown. We just did it in four minutes. So <laughs> anyway, and I don't mean to make light of it. I really, really don't. I think Tom Brady was right when he said, everybody have a little compassion for this guy. Let's not go killing him. And, and he's, I think he's absolutely right. Paul, I want to end with some football as we look forward to the last weekend of the season. Not a lot of drama. Most likely only one real playoff game in week, you know, with a team winning, they get into the playoffs. It, very likely that scenario is uh, the Raiders hosting the Los Angeles Chargers on Sunday night on NBC. Um, most likely the winner of that game uh, will make the AFC playoffs and very possibly will have a return date at Kansas City uh, on Wild Card Weekend. But Paul, I want you to give me a team right now. I've got one. Uh, I've actually got two. But I want you to give me a team. What team is hot going into the playoffs that you think watch out for them? They could really be trouble. I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you you said two instead of one because I, I have a couple teams here, one from each conference. Uh, and I don't think either one are a huge surprise. But number one, I can't wait to see what Cincinnati does in the postseason, yep. Peter. Uh, as an ex-quarterback, it is so much fun to watch Joe Burrow with the way he throws the ball downfield and the kind of true, genuine confidence he exudes. Uh, can't wait to see what January holds for him. And for different reasons, I'm excited to see what Philadelphia can do. Uh, they're doing it in a different way. They've got this really unique kind of energy and momentum. And Jalen Hurts is a fun watch. So I, I don't believe in them quite as much as I do in Cincinnati, but I am really excited to see what they can do with that rush offense, with this wave of momentum they have, and to see what they can do with Jalen Hurts. Uh, so those are two teams that my eyes are going to be fastened to. Look, I've been ridiculously smitten with Burrow uh, for most of this season. Before this season started, I said, um, watch out. We're watching the birth of the next Dan Fouts. Uh, and I, I still think that uh, the way he's played this year, it looks like he might be better than Fouts. But be that as it may, I'll tell you, there's a couple of teams, and I'm going to go a little bit different than you. If asked me, if asked one team, obviously I'm going to go with Cincinnati. But, and again, this is a weird one because it's a potential top seed, but. Tennessee fascinates me, absolutely fascinates me because they, at times this year, have looked really shaky, really troubled, uh, but, it, but they just keep hanging in there, hanging in there, hanging in there. They've got a quarterback who doesn't lose games in Ryan Tannehill, and it looks like, especially if they get the bye in the first round, and if they get the top seed, if they get that by, to me, it looks like um, they could get Derrick Henry back for their first playoff game. So I think they are a really, really interesting team headed into the playoffs. The other team that I think is very interesting, compelling as we sit here right now, they could be anywhere from the second to the, uh, to the fifth seed in the playoffs, and that is the Los Angeles Rams. And, and look, they're going to be at worst 12 and 5. If they beat San Francisco, <clears throat> they win the division, they'd be 13 and 4. If they lose to San Francisco and Arizona wins against Seattle, then Arizona is the two is is I forget what seed they'll be, but Arizona gets the home game, and then the Rams will be the wild card. Arizona would win the division. Here's why the Rams really interest me. It's because they've had an incredible amount of adversity. Read my column this week, Football Morning in America, my section about the Rams. There's, I do not understand when they have had 33 players 
out for part of the last now 23 days, 33 players out for part of that time. And my feeling is when you have that much missing and you go four and O in that stretch, three of the games on the road, all against really competitive playoff type teams, that team really interests me. And, and, and also if they have to play a game at green Bay at any point in the playoffs, here's what I say. Matthew Stafford might've played some bad games at Lambeau field in the cold, but you know what? He won't be afraid of Lambeau field in the cold because he's played there a hundred times. And so I just look at the Rams and they fascinate me, especially if Stafford doesn't turn it over. Give me your 30 second take on the Rams as we sit here right now. Uh, number one, the, I think that the, the most fascinating part is Matthew Stafford with that talent and the fact that he's kind of slipped back into to turning the ball over, uh, being a little bit careless with it at this time of year raises a lot of flags. So I want to see how he responds now. And you bring up if they have to go back to Lambeau. Their season going on or going to where a lot of us thought it could go could depend upon can that defense get Aaron Rodgers to turn the ball over? Turn it over twice the first game of the season, only two interceptions since. Can those players uh, that are making all that money, can they be the ones to make Aaron turn the ball over in January? We shall see. But, but that, that's what interests me the most about the Rams. Paul Burmeister, I, you know, we've scratched the surface on the National Football League. We have not talked much about Week 18. I think that's because it's one of the least dramatic weekends I remember to close an NFL season yeah. in a while. Um, not that it isn't, it, it won't be good drama to have a playoff game in game number 72, if that's what the Raiders and, uh, and Chargers turns out to be. But it's odd. A lot of what's most interesting right now in the NFL is happening off the field instead of on. But anyway, it'll be fun to watch um, whatever develops in week 18 and what the potential playoff matchups are. Uh, I, for one, really want to see New England and Buffalo somewhere, somehow, whether it be Saturday night primetime, uh, Sunday in a good spot, or on the first ever Monday night wildcard game in NFL history. So we'll see. But Paul, thanks so much for taking the time with me this week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.